Welcome to And That's Why We Drink. Woo! Oh my god, we did it! <laughs> I really thought we were gonna fuck that up. I'm surprised we didn't. Is that how we're just gonna start every one of these? Probably not. I hope not. Because <laughs> that's not gonna go over so well. So, this is uh, And That's Why We Drink, guest starring Geo today. It makes us sound really professional when you yeah. can hear the ambient sounds. Yeah, he's pitter pattering around our recording studio. <laughs> Your table full of wine that we have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, well I'm uh, I'm Christine. I'm M. You said that so <laughs> defeated. I was gonna try and do something clever and it didn't work out. Yeah, and I already told you this um, earlier, but my cousin is doing a research topic now on Christine Miller from what was it again? Jonestown. Yes! From, our, from our first episode. I'm so proud. I know. What's your cousin's name? Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for listening and for liking my, my little factoid. <laughs> Someone appreciated your extra research on I Christine like, Miller. I feel like I'm finally being like productive in my life, <laughs> helping you with your school project. We've gotten, we've gotten a lot of love from people. Yeah. And we really, really, really appreciate it. So thank you all. I'm just impressed someone besides our parents listened. I know. I can't believe it. We were so self-deprecating in the first episode because we, <laughs> we really thought we had four fans. I really I really thought it was just going to be our moms. Yeah. And then there was a couple more than that. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah. We're doing good. Thanks, guys. So what are you drinking tonight? So tonight, More Cabernet per usual? Or? Actually, this week, I, uh, I actually <laughs> strayed from the usual and switched from my box Cabernet to my box Chiraz. Uh-huh. Um, so Trader Joe's sells two boxed reds. Neat. The, yep, I had the Cabernet last week. The Shiraz is actually my favorite. So we've got a... Uh, it's hard to believe that that's your favorite when all you do is drink Cabernet. Yeah, you know. Whatever, I'm going to believe you. I'm full of surprises. I'm. You want to ask what I'm drinking? Or is this all me at this point? All I want to know is what you're drinking. Okay, well, it's um a, actually a pretty shitty strawberry milkshake. Is it bad? It's not bad. It's just you can tell it's... You just said it was shitty. Well... It was shitty quality. You can tell it was made in about 30 seconds without real ingredients. That's sad. It tastes good. It just tastes fake. That's It's like the, the syrup they add to the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it tastes like Nesquik powder. It's strawberry milkshake, for the record. I do like strawberry, that Nesquik strawberry stuff. I do, but I like it as milk. But, right. Not as milkshake. milkshake. Yeah. I'm going to get through it. It's fine. All right. I'm, I'm making my way. I believe in you. So what's going on in the world? Oh. Are you drinking for any particular reason listen why are we drinking this is why i'm drinking and i have this is why it's not even really specifically this week although i have been watching a lot of hgtv and sometimes they do los angeles episodes Mm -hmm. and it's kind of just like been on my brain that i'm living in la now i'm in this like pretty small apartment it's not small she has a nice apartment it's a nice apartment but like it's for three people it's not like for long term you know it's not like in 10 years that i hope to be living here true but your apartment is the most is the closest to, hey Joe, is the closest to looking like a home out of any of the apartments well, I've been to. That is really sweet. I everyone have, else I know, including myself, is living in shambles. Listen, I am unemployed, and therefore I have a lot of time on my hands <laughs> to quote unquote decorate. And I'm employed, which means every time I come to my apartment, I don't have time to clean because right. I get home so late. So it's not anyone's fault because I have. I look like I'm homeless. You look like you've built a house. No. Yeah. We're sitting in a real life kitchen right now. That's true. <clears throat> With that's, a real life dog. That's about as much as I've accomplished in my 25 years. I don't have a dog. <sighs> well, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> Sorry, Gio. Plug your ears. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I saw that the av- the median home price for a house in Los Angeles is six hundred thousand dollars, which Yikes. is like I think in Ohio it's like one hundred and twenty. Like it's a lot. It's a lot, lot, lot. And that's for. I mean, there are some houses in this neighborhood. They're like kind of run down, but they're kind of cute. And I'm like, oh, that'd be a nice starter home. And then I looked them up on Redfin or Zillow and they're like $1.2 million. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean, we'll never afford that. You know, anyway. I, I mean, depending on where you live, though, like it's so different. Like when I first moved out here, I lived on a couch. Well, I lived on a couch with someone I didn't know. And I was still paying almost a thousand dollars for a broken couch. Like it was a futon that didn't even fold in, out into a thousand dollars. It was 900 Oh, oh no. And it was a, a futon that didn't fold out, so I just had, like, a couch. And I just lived out of my suitcase on that couch. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome so, to LA. It's casual. <sighs> and that's why I drink this Wow. Week. All of a sudden, that's why I drink, too. Sorry. I'm sorry. I really 
<laughs> really just bummed me out. Bringing us down. Ugh. Why do you drink this week? Uh, I drink because, well, one thing, I've been trying to lose weight. And I haven't gained any weight. That's not the problem. That's good. Yeah. I mean, so I guess I, I drink in a happy way. But I also, so when we started this podcast, I didn't realize how much work a podcast is. And so I didn't go to the gym all last week. Oh, oops. My yeah. Bad. And I try to run five miles a day, minimum. How do you do that? I scream cry. I can't do that. But people think I'm... When I tell people I run at least five miles a day, they think like I happily do that. And they're like, oh, we should go running together. And I'm like, oh, no, you don't understand what I look like. Like, I'm I'm really like about to die. When I was in third grade, we had to read this book about the Iditarod. <laughs> do you know what that is? Yes. <laughs> like the, like the, the huskies, like yep. the... The sled, the sled racing. mushing yeah. races, and uh, at the end of the book, like their the favorite dog has run so much that his heart burst on the way to the finish line. Are you what? At eight years old, I had to learn read a about a that dog's children. heart bursting, and it was the little kid's best friend. Children should not read that. Basically, I feel like that dog every day at and the gym. I'm your best friend, right? And you're my dog. That's gonna have a. I think that was the heart. first time you've ever called me your best friend. No, I said I'm your best friend. Oh. Well, you're assuming things. I just want to, like, <laughs> oh. specify. We're in a place now. This is uh, awkward. You want to be my best friend? Come on. <laughs> anyway, that's why I drink. Listen, we're drinking tonight. How are you feeling about um, ghosts today? I am feeling just already freaked out. I feel like all of this is going to my... All the murder and ghosts are going to my head, but I love it at the same time, you know? Yeah, I'm always nervous now about, like, if my roommate or someone, like... Like, today I did my research at, I stayed away from the Starbucks, and I went to a Panera, and I was so nervous the whole time of people, like, looking at my tabs on my computer, because I just had, like, every tab was a new picture of a death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a bunch of serial killers bookmarked on my computer, so if any, if I die or go missing and someone looks at my... Right. Yeah. It's a bad look, but it's all for <laughs> the What is a reputation these days? <laughs> I do it all for the podcast. <laughs> Well, um, I have a story that I've wanted to tell since the beginning. Oh, I'm so excited. I've been ready my whole life. Oh, we also wanted to say before we get started that we are going, we've gotten some really great listener stories sent into us. Yes. At our email. And that's why we drink at Mm -hmm. gmail.com. And we have some really awesome ones that are better than anything we can find on, on Wikipedia. Uh, So we are going to dedicate a whole episode to listener stories. And that's going to be coming up next. Every first of the month, right? we're going to be posting an episode that we didn't research at all. We're just taking listener stories. Right. We're sharing your stories over the air. So if you have anything. If you, yeah. If any, and it doesn't just have to be ghosts for paranormal. If you have like an alien story, if you have like a conspiracy theory, mm-hmm. if you've been murdered. Yeah. That's anything, a good one. Any good story or stalkers. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, any anything that really would just make someone cringe anything and you want us creepy. to talk about it. Yeah, give it to us. We're ready. It's uh and that's why we drink at gmail.com. Absolutely. So that being said, we are not getting into your stories today. Sorry folks. Next yeah. week. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> uh so my story is one of my favorite famous hauntings. Sweet. Uh it's the Amityville Horror. <gasps> yeah. That's like the big one. I know, it is. Because I've before we ever did this podcast, I never shut up about it with oh, you. Oh, man. This is M's, like... This is my bread and butter. Your shining moment. I actually didn't even really need to, like, write notes. I was like, oh, yeah. I, I, know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's memorized. I tried, to mem- I tried to, like, find something I didn't know, and I couldn't. So I, I, I did this mainly so I would stay on track. Got it. Okay. And I'm also hoping... I want to do it justice, but I also don't want to talk about it for hours. Sure. There's probably so much. So I'm just going to give you the, the bare bones. Sup, Gio. He doesn't like me, guys, by the way. This is like the only dog who has an issue with me. Gio has an issue with everyone. I happen to be one of those people. But anyway, hopefully hopefully he likes the story, too. Uh, my dad grew up in Long Island. And so the first time I ever heard about the Amityville Horror House, he... It sounded like I said a whorehouse. <laughs> Horror house. Um, when I first heard about it, I remember my dad always telling me that he lived, like, right next to the house, which I don't think is actually true. I think he was just trying to scare me. Spooky. But I'm going to tell everyone I know 
that he lives right next door, guys, and he saw the ghosts himself. Oh, my good. All right. So the Amityville Horror, Horror, if you're from New York. Horror. Oh, the Horror. Please just delete that part. (laughs) Uh, All right. So it started in 1974 with the DeFeo family. You know about the Amityville Horror. I do. I watched like a... The I, documentary you showed, showed I me. made you watch that. I made everyone watch that. Yeah, I watched that. It was creepy as fuck. <clears throat> Am I allowed to plug that? Am I allowed to... Yeah. On Hulu, if you have a Hulu account, there is a movie called My Amityville Horror instead of The Amityville Horror. And uh, it's one of the... There's a family <laughs> that's involved in, in The Amityville Horror House, and there were kids that are in, involved in the story. And one of the kids did a documentary now that he's like in his 50s and he says everything that actually happened not just what like the movies and reenactments have said like he gave his account of it the okay so the DeFeo family uh in 1974 was a mom dad and five kids and the oldest one's name was Ronald and he was 23 when this when the story began so they lived on 112 Ocean Avenue Which, if you wanted to GPS that or walk to it or do whatever you want, go for that. There's your address. And uh, Ronnie, November... I didn't put the actual date, but November of 1974, at 3.15 in the morning, Ronnie takes a shotgun uh, out of their house and he shoots his sleeping parents, then his two brothers, and then his two sisters. Jesus. And... uh, then he leaves. One of the, one of the stories is that he leaves and tosses his bloody clothes um, out of the house, like brings them somewhere else, and then he goes to work. Um, then after work, he goes to the bar and screams to the bartender and everyone there that his family's been murdered. And oh boy! When the cops go and investigate the house, they find the actual weapon and the shotgun shell under his bed. Oh great! So he wasn't like too slick about it. Sure. Um, and so he was taken in, he ended up confessing, uh, he tried blaming it on a friend for like a second, um, and he ended up confessing and saying that he doesn't remember doing it, he was possessed by, like, ghosts in the house that were making him do it. Oh boy. And, uh, so he's still in jail, I don't know if he died, I don't think he's, I don't think he died yet, but he is in jail 25 to life now. Oh boy. Since then, he's still in jail. There's another story from one of the other millions of documentaries I've watched on what actually happened after he shot them. And his account, when they've done interviews with him in jail, is that he shot his whole family, still really doesn't remember it, and thinks he was possessed. And when he found out what he did, he tried to stow the gun away under his bed and then ran to his best friend's house to tell them what happened. Okay. That's where that story ends. Ever After that happened, the house was vacant for like 13 months. And... Um, they couldn't really sell it because there was a mass murderer there. They couldn't figure out if it truly was a murder or, like, a demonic possession. He was the first person to really roll with the demonic possession sure. kind of alibi. And um, at any rate, the house ended up selling in 1975 to the Lutz family, which was George Lutz, his wife Kathy, and Kathy's three kids. So okay. George's stepkids. So uh, after the Lutz's got the house, the beginning of all of the paranormal stuff happened right away. Like, it happened, like, the day that they moved in. And... Didn't they get the house, like, super discounted because of the murder? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was, well, it was $80,000 uh-huh. back in 75, which I didn't do the math. I should have figured out how much that actually is worth. But I know that it was super discounted, because this was, like, a five-floor house. Like, yeah. it was, it was a huge house. Right, right. With, like, right. a like a pool and like um like it had like a, a ocean view right uh the day that they moved in the first thing that happened was the priest met them there to i guess bless the house just in general just you know whether or not there was a murder there i'm sure that families then were just having a priest That's true. Come i've heard of people doing that and uh as soon as the priest got there he went upstairs to the playroom that well i guess they were gonna call it the playroom and he couldn't even go in there like they don't know what happened but as soon as he went up there and looked in he like booked out of the house oh that's a great sign that was like the first thing that happened and then 
as soon as he left, one of the sons, uh, who was 10 at the time when they moved in, mm-hmm. um, they he went upstairs to put a box in the playroom and there was like hordes, like four to five hundred flies flying around. Ugh. And this was like mid-December in Long Island. Like there was no flies. That gives me the heebie-jeebies. Immediately. Ugh. This is actually also... It's a badass motorcycle wow. out there. Someone really had a point to prove. So uh, this is also the inspiration for The Exorcist where all the flies oh. were. Oh. Yeah. That's interesting. That came from the Amityville house. Interesting. And uh, so it became a regular thing where there would be like 500 flies and you would go around killing all them and you would know that you just killed them and you go downstairs to go brag about killing the flies and you bring people upstairs to see and there are no flies, there's no bodies, there's no newspaper that you killed them with. Like it was just oh, a, so the dead flies would disappear. Yeah, like Ugh. almost like they were like ghost dead flies or something. Yeah, but there was like they were nowhere to be found. Like you could smash them. Like I mean, if you're killing five hundred flies, like they're all over the room and they're all gone now. Yuck. So another thing that started happening, I guess, with the the guys in the house started becoming much more angry oh. and had much like um, they got they just they just were really hyper aggressive. Like aggression, yeah. And the girls were very, like, flattered and felt, like, loved in the house, like, had a sense of peace. So they were almost, like, in a trance that everything was fine. Meanwhile, the guys were, like, getting really violent. And there was George, who I guess already had problems with the kids because it was his his stepkids. Mm -hmm. And he comes from a military background and never knew how to be a dad. So he's just, like, super disciplinary and strict and an asshole in general. Right. And, um... So the tension between him and his stepsons already got, was getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And um, so their anger, I guess, in turn fueled whatever energy was there. And things just increasingly got more bad as time went on. Right. And uh, one of the things that George, the dad, experienced was he could never get warm. Like, there are accounts of them keeping that house as hot as possible like the furnace was basically choking because they had so much wood in there and they would have the heater all the way up and like it would be like 100 degrees in a room because they were trying so hard to get it warm and he would be like like wrapped in a blanket like shivering and if you even if you were in that room you could walk like five feet and there'd be like a 20 degree difference in the house like there were just cold spots Everywhere. Ugh, how weird. Um, also, at 3.15 a.m., which was the time that Ryan DeFeo killed all of his family... Yes. ...was the same time that um, every night that they stayed in the house, George Lutz would wake up, and he said that he either heard a giant door slamming, or he would hear a gunshot, or he would have woken up to, like, the sound of music or screams. Music or screams? Yep. Yikes. And, uh... He would wake up in weird places. Like, when he woke up to the sound of a gunshot, he wouldn't be in his bed. He would, like, be outside of his house. Yuck. Or he'd be, like, downstairs in the basement where, like, no one even went. Or, um, you know, the usual stuff. Just the standard. Just the stuff that happens all the time. Um, Also, Kathy Lutz, the wife, she had a bunch of dreams where she was looking through Ronnie DeFeo's eyes and she witnessed how he murdered everyone and was able to give an account that the newspapers weren't even able to give. Oh, like details that... She was able to tell you, like, the chronology of who died in what order. Oh, what the yeah. hell? The kids, also, this was an, another part of, like, them being connected to, like, the DeFeo murders, is all of the kids, after, like, the day they moved in, all the way until they left, they all... Once they fell asleep, they would, like, roll into the position of, like, whatever kid died in that bed. What? So, like, like if you walked around and I saw all the kids sleeping, they'd be sleeping in the exact position that a kid died in that same spot. Wait, like, the kids from the first yeah. family? Yeah. Because he killed his two sisters and his two brothers. Oh. Like, he shot them. I should have said that. He shot them in their beds while they were sleeping. I had forgotten there were all those siblings, too. Yeah. So we shot them in bed while they were sleeping. And then the kids in the next family would sleep in the same position. As they died. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. And uh, one time, the older brother, um, I guess it was a regular thing at this point that, like, the dog started to try to kill himself. The dog? Like, the family dog was, like, freaked out by stuff and would try to hang himself (gasps) with a chain. 
Like Never he would heard like of such a thing. He would literally try to like choke himself. Like he would run while he was chained, knowing he was strangling himself, and keep running. Or he would try to jump over a fence if the chain was too short. That's and, so sad. And like once you like threw him over the fence to get him back to safety, he would do it again. Or um, uh, like they had a, a boathouse uh-huh. on the property, and the, they would watch the garage just slam up and slam down and slam up and slam down, and the whole family would watch it. Like, the whole family would have to work together to close it and keep it shut and, like, pull it down. That's awful. So one of the nights that they were doing that, I guess the oldest son and the stepdad, they were outside trying to close the garage door and then looked up into the window of the little sister's room and they saw what looked like a cartoon character of a pig with wolf-like teeth and laser red beam eyes. What? Yeah. Laser beam red eyes. Like, it just looked like a pig smiling at them with, like, wolf-like teeth. And so, being, like, the older brother, he ran into the room to see what happened and looked in the room, and his sister wasn't there, and the rocking chair was, like, rocking super back and forth, like, rocking back. So he said it looked like a cartoon A cartoon character of a pig. And, And a pig, that description is usually in a lot of, like, demonic folklore. Really? Mm hmm what, like cartoonish like like i have a friend who's a medium and has and only a couple instances has seen like a pig run by her but it's like it looks like a like you can't describe it but it's like a devil pig like it's like a pig that doesn't look like a pig but it has like weird like hooves and like it's really uh, fucked up i'm gonna have bad <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> <clears throat> but so he saw so did two of them see that <clears throat> Both of them saw it, yeah. So it was the dad and the son? Yeah. Ugh. And they both ran into the room, and all they saw in there was the rocking chair moving back and forth. And then they, like, tried to figure out why the rocking chair was moving back and forth. And then they came back, like, 20 minutes later, and it was still rocking no. the same speed. Um, one, So the daughter, because there was two boys and a girl, the daughter be, uh, started having an imaginary friend. Oh, that's never a good sign. Especially in this kind of house. But the imaginary friend's name was the same as the one of the sisters that got shot. <gasps> and she was sleeping in the room that that little girl got shot. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> That's so creepy. And it became a regular thing where, like, if they saw, like, their sister, like, through a window or, in a, like, in a way, like, through a mirror or something, there would always be, like, a, like a pig, <gasps> like, behind her. Like, if they looked really quickly, they'd see a pig and then double take and it was gone. Or they would see, like, a little girl smiling with, like, laser beam eyes. Or they thought there was a couple times where she was possessed, and when she would smile at them or no. turn around, she had laser red oh, eyes. Oh, God, this gives me the creep. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's so scary. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Uh, they also found, like, green slime coming out of the walls. Oh, I've heard about that. Like an ectoplasm kind of thing? Right, like, I've heard of slime coming out of walls. Apparently, the movies made it sound more like flubber exploded you know what i mean like jello <laughs> flubber <laughs> but um but apparently it was more like a liquid like a basically green blood yeah and it was like seeping through so they thought they had like water damage sure. but it was green and sludgy so they called it what they call it like paranormal puke or something like that oh. i was like way to be creative in a okay. time of distress good one <laughs> um they also had the cold spots they had Different people had dreams about different murders. Like, the older son, he had dreams about um, watching the dog try to kill himself. And then there would be, like, their roles always reversed in his dreams. Like, he had this dream for, like, years, even after they moved out of the house. Where, like, either he would be the dog trying to kill himself, or he'd watch the dog try to kill himself, or the dog would try to kill him. Or, <gasps> like, he just had every every night he had, like, the same dream for, like, almost all of his life. And, um... God. So, after, um... It also started following the kids in the neighborhood. Like, when they said that they were going to school and they, like, would skip school, they could feel something, like, following them around in the neighborhood and, like, ugh, it freaks me out. Like, yes. I know what it's like to feel stared at. I'm, ugh, yeah. it freaks me out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And then after Christmas, which was only, like, a week later, because they moved in mid-December. Oh. Um, by the way, they only stayed 28 days in this house. Oh, so this was all really This was fast. all within four weeks. Oh, yeah. Like a whole February. You know what I mean? I get it. Okay. <laughs> but not uh, on a leap year. Nope. Uh, after they took the Christmas lights down, things got increasingly worse. Like, much more worse. Much more worse? Much worse. Much worse. Much worse. Much uh, more worse. Gosh. I went to school, guys. So much milkshake in her system. I know. Uh, 
so it started with like this like crazy stench like they said like foul like new york sewage stench in the whole house um they also said that there was a crucifix on the wall that you could watch like turn itself upside down (gasps) and the stench would come from that yep and uh so because the stench was so bad, they regularly were going around trying to open all the windows, but there were some windows that would get stuck for no reason. And the oldest son was trying to, like, rip this window open, but it was stuck, and so he finally got it open, and he had his hands on the ledge, and when his <gasps> brother turned around and said, did, or when his brother was behind him and said, hey, did you get the window, he turned around, he turned his head around to say, yeah, I got it. And when he wasn't looking at his hands or saw on the ledge, the window went slamming <gasps> down on his hands and crushed his fingers like skin to skin. Like the bone was just gone. Like top, like the top skin of your finger to the bottom skin of your finger were touching. <gasps> like totally fucked up his hands. Oh. <clears throat> so after that happened, like it was like intentionally stuck on his hands because then like you could hear him screaming and the brother, the mom, the dad, the dad's friend who was there that day were all trying to move this window up and it was like not <gasps> going up. And then all of a sudden when they stopped trying to get it up, the window opened on its own. Of course. And the mom brings the son down to the kitchen to try to take care of his fingers. And as she's turned around about to get like like ice out of the freezer, uh he even he like so he told the story in the documentary and he you can tell it like still messes him up like he does not want to talk about it uh but there was they saw a full spirit apparition standing at the doorway looking at him and then walked towards him and his hands were sticking out over the table like he was sitting at at the chair his hands were over the table so they were like in the essentially like more out in the middle of the kitchen Uh and the spirit walked through his hands and then sat down next to him at the table and he could see like the imprint of on the chair of the spirit sitting there. And as he was looking at the spirit, he like blinked and looked back at his hands and his hands were totally fine. Like bone was reconstructed, like everything was totally fine on his hands. And they didn't hurt anymore? No, his hands are totally fine. The only thing is his left pinky still has a hook in it, like still like kind of curves, but everything is, his hands were totally rebuilt and like literally like a blink. That and his, the spirit walked through it, and then he looked back at his hands, and they were fine. Ugh, that gives me the creeps, honestly. Okay, so that same kid, um, he... One of the other stories that he had was he remembers walking up the stairs to his room. Like, he had just gotten in a fight with the stepdad. And he was walking upstairs, and his mom was behind him, kind of chasing him to be like, Hey, come back. And I guess that negative energy was out in the house, and something, some invisible force threw him up the stairs, like oh. not pushed him down the stairs, but like almost like grabbed him by the legs while he was walking and dragged him up. So he went feet up, floating, thrown up the stairs. What the hell? <laughs> and the mom watched it happen. So she ran up to like get up there to see if he was OK. <clears throat> and she got there and whatever had dragged him, he he says in his perspective, it like went into his body and he felt possessed. He remembers not having control of his body, seeing his mom and thinking it wasn't his mom. (gasps) And then when she went to like grab his arm to like, see if she was, if he was okay, the like thing, the spirit that was in him went into her. And so he got the other perspective of it because it it left his body, went into her body. So he got to experience what it was like to have it in his body and then see someone with, with it in their body. If that makes sense. So did he see himself or did he see No, he like possessed? he like says that he felt the spirit leave his arm and go, and into, go into the arm that was touching him into his mom's body and he could like see that she wasn't herself. Oh. Like her eyes were glassed over and everything. So she, that was probably what he looked like right before it transferred. Ugh. Um and then it went away, but like they had that experience together. Uh so they started having I don't remember which happened first, but the news got involved at this point. Right. It was starting to get involved because I guess word on the street was like things were going on in that house. And it finally came down to day 28 where the whole family will still refuse to talk about what actually happened. And that was the day they left? That was the day they left. So day 28, uh, the first thing that happened was it was at nighttime. Like everything was just as usually creepy. And then, uh, you know people are still getting really, really warm and really hot and they're really aggressive and the women are 
like the little girl is still playing with her imaginary friend who at some point got her to go walk onto the roof of the house and say, you can be my friend forever if you just jump. What? Yeah. Her like imaginary friend who like was probably the daughter, like her mom found her outside standing on the roof and like grabbed her and was like, what are you doing? And she was like, Jody said I could be your friend forever. And, oh my God. Yeah. And they didn't know that the daughter's name, because I guess at the time they were minors, so, like, you couldn't say who died or who got shot. And the only way they knew is because the priest that went to their house to bless the house was friends with the DeFeos before the death and was like, your daughter is, has an imaginary friend, the same name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? How did they know that the kids were sleeping in the same positions? Autopsy reports. Oh, okay. Because the parents, like, the parents were totally in the know about the murders before they got this house. Right. And they asked to look at everything so they weren't, like, misled by the oh. realtor. Oh, God. Okay. Um, so the night that they left, it started with the boys, because they shared a room together, the two boys. Mm-hmm. They shared a levitating experience out of their beds. <gasps> like, they were in their beds, and the beds themselves were levitating and crashing into each other, like the footbed. The footboards were crashing into each other. And the craziest part is both of those beds were, like, they were stuck in sheetrock. Like, the bottoms of the beds were cemented into the ground, so there's no way they should have been lifted up and banging. Oh, my God. And uh, so they were, like, screaming for their parents' help. And apparently George Lutz couldn't get out of bed. Like, something was sitting on him or preventing him from getting up. So he couldn't leave the bed. He just heard his kids screaming. And, uh... The mom was also levitating right next to him, and he was, like, grabbing her arm to, like, keep her from floating away. Yeah. And then he looked at her, and she had aged into, like, an old woman that looked like she was, like, 90 years old. (laughs) And it apparently took, like, an hour for it to go away. This is Like, imagine, like, thinking, like, just lying there. You can't get out of bed, and you're stuck. You hear your kids screaming. You grab your wife because she's fucking floating. And then you look at her, and she's an old 90-year-old woman. (laughs) I am so creeped out. <laughs> Yuck. So eventually, uh, they all get out, <clears throat> and, or, like, he's able to get out of bed, and their phones aren't working, typical, and there's, like, static, and they can't reach anyone. They don't have cell phones. They just have, like, the one house phone. Right. And then he had an office phone in the basement, and he went down to the basement to, like, and that phone was working, and they called the priest, and they were like, can you come back, like, to bless the house, like nothing's like all this stuff is happening right now and the priest was like why are you there (laughs) like like if everything you're telling me is true like why are you in that fucking house like i'm not coming to bless the house you get out of the house that's the real question like yeah get the fuck out like why weren't you thinking oh yeah i should leave you know i mean legitimately i'm stuck in a year-long lease and if something even pulled my hair (laughs) i'm gone i'm gone i don't care (laughs) well that's what they ended up doing. They um, they grabbed the kids, <clears throat> still in their night clothes. They said, like, I don't even think they said pack a bag. I think they just grabbed them and just got in the car and literally never came back. Like, Jeez. never went back. Like, the house was just abandoned. And um, they moved to San Diego to get as far away as possible. And that's when all the TV deals started because when people were like, hey, you just bought this giant house and 28 days in, like, you you left in the mm-hmm. middle of the night. Like, what happened? And so the news started getting in, into it. And one of the news channels, like, they gave the, – the Lutz family gave them the exclusive to be like, okay, you can do whatever you want with this, like, but we're trusting you to, like, do it tastefully and keep our kids out of it and all that. Uh-huh. And uh, – So they did the exclusive, the girl who ran it, the reporter, she was really close with a lot of people in the parapsychology world. Right. So she knew like a bunch of the medium. She knew like the Warrens. Um, the, they also did like, if you've seen the movie, like the conjuring or the, the doll Annabelle, um, which are both things I'll probably be talking about at some point. Which are both things I've never seen because I am a wuss. Oh, you should watch them. You should at least watch the conjuring. That's a great movie. And conjuring two is even better. Not going to happen. The Conjuring is the only movie series where the sequel is better than the original. Really? Yeah. It's so good. Anyway, I'll get you to watch it. We'll see. Um, she knows everyone that's anyone at that time in that field, and they all go do an investigation together with a bunch of reporters, and lo and behold, nothing happened because people actually wanted proof. 
the only thing that happened was one cameraman who's been through like he went to like war zones and like went to really intense investigative like places like places that they were like really shooting in dangerous areas right he also wasn't a believer but when he went into the house he tried to go like on the stairs and he couldn't go up the stairs like something wasn't letting him go up the stairs like he had like this gut feeling to not go up oh. and he also had like these heart palpitations that he'd never experienced excuse me and um like he like, it was just weird that like for him who's so skeptical like even he felt uncomfortable yeah but that was the only thing that was weird and then a photograph that they got while they were there i'm gonna just show it to you so they got this photo which I will post on our... Oh, you guys have to go look this up. I will, I will post it on our on our social media. I'm sorry. Everybody has to go look this up. If you're too lazy to go look at our social media, just type in Amityville ghost picture. No, look it up right now. And uh, they... It's, it's a picture. It's black and white. And over the banister, you can see a little boy looking... I'm going to have nightmares. ...at the camera. Truly. And it's definitely a little boy leaning over. It, and uh, the... The thing about that investigation is there were no animals, there were no children, there was nobody but the investigative reporters and the people in the parapsychology field. And this that was were in there. the seventies, right? This was in the seventies. So they're not like photoshopping shit. And this was on a film photo that they they I got this turn developed. It away. I don't want to look at it. Anymore. <laughs> they got it developed that same weekend, and that's like this is the closest thing to proof that they have, especially because when you put that picture next to one of the DeFeo boys that nope. got shot, it is that kid. Which is the other scary thing. I'm not kidding. That is unsettling. It's actually one of the... Um, this picture has been rated as, like, one of the closest things we have to evidence of ghosts. Really? Because so many people were at that house that night. I think it was, like, 20 people. And all 20 of them are, like, even the skeptics are like, we took that picture that night. That picture is not doctored. We all saw that picture once it got developed. Like, it's the closest thing we have to proof that ghosts are real. I'm not kidding. If you're driving, don't look it up. <laughs> but honestly, fucking look it up. This is the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Okay. Apparently, John Matthew DeFeo was the little boy who got shot by Ronnie. All right. And this is definitely him. I don't ever want to see it again. Okay. But everyone else has to go look at it. Um, so anyway, that was the only thing besides the guy with the palpitations. <laughs> you're still freaking out. It's really freaky. Um... That happened. Where else? Why? Oh, oh, oh. Before they fled, I thought this was really interesting, that George and Kathy, they tr before they tried to flee, they decided to have their own, um, like, I guess, blessing to, like, bless the house. Uh -huh. And they didn't really know what they were doing, I guess. Great. But they were basically just holding each other, saying the Lord's Prayer, just trying to get anything away from them. And they, you could hear them, you could hear multiple people around them shouting, uh, oh, it was something like, will you stop? Will you stop? But like, like really sarcastically, like, will you stop? Like, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> like a sassy uh, ghost. Excuse me. <laughs> so, uh, I'm here to stay. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Like, I mean, terrifying. If I were them, I would be like, nope. Yeah, it's cool now. But yeah, and then George found a room in the basement that wasn't actually on the original blueprints of the house. And when he opened it up, it was an entire room painted red that the dog refused to go <gasps> near. Like you, like, you could drag that dog as hard as you wanted. It would not go near that room. Um, another thing is one time, well, because he was always so cold, um, he would tend the fire every night. George Lutz would tend a fire. Right. And uh, one time when he uh, tried to, I guess he was, like, stoking one fire and then putting heat somewhere else, he turned around and saw his wife. But his wife had changed shape again, like, instead of a 90-year-old woman this time. He was, she was a demon with half of her head blown out like she had gotten shot by Ronnie DeFeo. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> uh, when closing the daughter's window one time, um, oh, I already said this, uh, that Jody, the little girl, was like, oh, come live with me forever. Which I think is pretty terrible. In the snow, because it was mid-December, they would find, like, cloven hoof prints, no. like, leaving their house every morning. What? Yeah. Like, on the doorsteps. Like, like the devil was going to work? In the yeah. <laughs> like, they were like, all right, I'll see you later tonight. Oh, and <clears throat> the other thing about the daughter, who was probably possessed at different times by the by the girl that once lived there, um, 
she would constantly sing in her room and every time she'd left she would like be her normal self and not sing and then she would go back into the room and sing exactly where she had left off it was almost like that one room kept her in a trance and (gasps) they found out later that that song was the only song that like jody knew before she died okay god yeah this just gets worse and worse yeah that's pretty terrible yeah, the only other thing I have to say is the Warrens, who are, like, the like the two big, like, mediums. Oh, he, well, the husband wasn't a medium. It was a husband and wife duo, and the husband was just, like, very well knowledgeable about all of this stuff. And his wife, Lorraine, was a medium, so they would, they were known at the time as, like, the top demonologists who would go cleanse houses when priests couldn't even do it. Okay. And she said that this investigation at the Amityville house was the worst thing she's ever been to. And it was the closest to hell she's ever felt. And this was a medium who could, like, trance back and, like, go into, like, different times. Like, she was, like, crazy capable of doing a lot of weird stuff. And she said this was the closest to hell she ever felt. And uh, going into that playroom where even the priest wouldn't go in, she said that she saw, like, a hundred, like, shadow people staring at her, not letting her in the room. Wow. That's... All in a hard day's work. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Well, they say one of the, the a lot of people say that it might be the, um, the DeFeo, the ghosts of the DeFeo family that died there that caused all of this. But there's also a lot of talk of George Lutz before he even moved there being heavily into the occult. I've heard about that. And so they think that maybe he triggered something by being in a house being full of so open and trying to. He probably was trying something, and he happened to be in the house of like six dead people anyway. And he probably, it was like, I think in the documentary they said it was like a magic trick gone wrong. Like he thought he was doing something and he didn't really know what he was playing with. And then by open something up. Yeah. So they think that's another thing. And the kids have all, in different documentaries, they've all kind of been featured. Um, And they've all said that they witnessed him doing things involving the occult in that house. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another thing. And then the big thing about the Amityville Horror is... Either it's 100% true and all of this really did happen, which the entire family that lived there, they swore to the day that they died Yeah, that this happened. Um, but a lot of people think it was like a money-making scheme of they knew there were murders in this house. They lived there and then fled and said a bunch of ghosts were there. Um, and then they just wanted to make a bunch of money. But I feel like you wouldn't lay down $80,000 and never make like, unless you really thought this was going to be, like, a super profitable Agreed. investment. I mean, I've heard that, too, and it's just hard to believe that they would... Everything from the... I mean, you can't make this shit up. Like, everything from the the pig that looks like a cartoon yeah, demon yeah. pig in the window smiling and the fingers in the window. I mean, how do you even make all those details up and all the entire family corroborates it? Yeah, the whole family. I mean, but the other side to that is, well, they were all really young and you could easily, like, just sure. tell them what they saw. But I think, like, no 10-year-old knows what it's like to have a spirit go through your hands and reconstruct your fucking fingers. You know? Ugh. I mean, you can't make Or, like, up. like, I don't care how young I am. I would remember on my own a bed breaking out of cement and crashing into my brother's yeah. bed. Yeah, and if my mom was like, pretend that your bed hit your brother's bed. Yeah. So that we can be on the news. Yeah. And also, if you watch the documentary, there's a lot of... Skeptics, I will say, like, oh, well, you know, he just really hated his stepdad, so he made mm-hmm. up this whole story to make his stepdad look like an ass or right. things like that. But, I mean, you can tell just by the way he talks. Like, I don't... you. Something happened to him that just made him, like, a very... Like, he's, like, a very, like, tough New York guy of, like, oh, no one can touch me. Like, he just acts very much like he's shielding. Yeah. Uh, he, I mean, just, he... Something happened to him. Like, I mean, the way that he acts, like, he he really believes it. I don't... Whether or not all of it happened, he really is convicted in this. You can see it. I mean, in that documentary, like, he is fucked up from that, too. Like, he will yeah. talk about it and be shaken to... Like, you can see it. There's points where he's like, I don't want to talk he's about like this. He's, like, near tears, and he's like, I can't. And he's a grown, like, tough New York man. Yeah, like, like you don't, middle You don't guy. cry on command. No. Anyway, that documentary is called My Amityville Horror, and you can find it on Hulu. And it is creepy. I've probably watched it a hundred times. It's creepy, I'll tell you. Anyway, that's the Amityville Horror. All right, well, that is just, ugh, ugh. I'm going to have nightmares. 
Give me nightmares. I need some like sage up in here. We should probably get sage. We should probably. <laughs> With how much we talk we about this stuff. We sit in my house all day long and talk I get to about leave. This. I'm like, see ya. Exactly. And you leave me with Geo and the demons. All mm-hmm. right. All right. What are, what are we talking about? You know how I like to lighten the mood? <laughs> I, I love when you do. We're going to talk about a bunch of missing children. <gasps> all right. All right. So uh, this is a story about the solder children. <gasps> oh, wow. Someone, someone sent in a uh, request for us to do the solder children. Oh, my God. OK, well, I'm going to pretend like I knew about that. OK, we are. We are Thanks for the suggestion, guys. Who is it? I don't remember. Oh. But someone someone wrote in. Thanks, fans. This is what we're talking about. Look, see, we need these. We need these suggestions. So thanks. We got a so suggestion. There's at least one person who's very excited for what you're about to say. Love it. So George and Jenny Sauter uh, were a really respectable middle class couple. They were living in Fayetteville, West Virginia in the 1940s. Cool. Italian descent, um, business people. They were well respected, well liked. Uh, they lived in a two story timber house uh, two miles north of town and had 10 children over, Jesus. I know, over a period of 10 years, which today is just unspeakable, but you know. It's unneeded. Really the opposite of needed. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so on 1945, Christmas Eve, the younger kids were really excited about some presents they had gotten from their older sister, so they asked to stay up past their bedtime, and their mom, Jenny, allowed it, like sometimes she did. Uh, right. It happens. <laughs> right. As okay. A, as a mother of a dog, um, I can say... <laughs> sometimes you let him stay up and open yeah, a gift. Sometimes. So they uh, stayed up and played with their toys, and she took the two-year-old daughter, Sylvia, and went to bed. Uh, so her husband and two oldest boys were already in bed... Um, so everything seemed fine, but that night at 12.30 a.m., she heard the telephone ring. So she ran downstairs, answered the phone, and the woman at the other end of the line was someone she didn't recognize, asking for a name she had never heard of. And she said, you know, you got the wrong number. Oh, I hate that. I know. It's creepy. I hate that. Have you ever... No, you haven't. There's... Okay, one of the only movies that's ever really, like, messed me up was The Strangers. I... That's something I would... Literally never. <laughs> it's like normally nothing scares me. The only thing that scares me is like real life situations. And the strangers is like a very real life thing. Is it like they're calling from inside the house? No, it was. Um, so because you're never going to watch it, it starts with like they're it's a couple and they're in like a cabin by themselves. Typical. Obviously. And well, like they were like. We're supposed to have got, it's really a, like, a, it's a long story. Basically, they were supposed to be there to celebrate their engagement. And then she awkwardly said no. So like, they, <laughs> <laughs> I know. So they go to like this cabin that's like all romantically set up and there's roses and candles. And so just like awkwardly, like, you know, hanging out. But so someone knocks on the door in like the middle of the night and you open the door and she's like, is Tamra home? Stop it. <laughs> and then like. They're like, no, sorry. And so they just like close the door on her. And like 20 minutes later, we hear a knock on the door and through the door, they hear, is Tamra home? Stop it. Em. <laughs> and, then, and then they're like, no, you already came by here. And she's like, are you sure? <gasps> and like, Ugh! and then it like freaks me out because then there's like three of them and then they're in the house and they were already in the house and Tamra or whoever that girl was, was like just a distraction, but they were already people. And it fucks me up. Like I am so like, there's nothing that's more terrifying to me than like, than like things that can can definitely happen happen. (laughs) like things that can definitely happen in our dimension yeah yeah yeah. so hearing like someone call the phone be like is Tamara home if someone i don't even want to say it out loud but now i need to if someone ever called me and said is Tamara home i would i would cry like a baby all right check our twitter i'm gonna i'm gonna release (laughs) m's phone number tonight no 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 i'd like you all to call (laughs) from unidentified numbers Uh, god there's there's nothing creepier i will never name my child Tamara. Purely because of The Strangers. If you really want to scare yourself, go watch The Strangers. I don't. I don't. I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Okay. Well, if you guys want to do it, it's, listen, it's... There it is. your own grave. All right. Anyway, so this, she answers the phone. The lady asks for Tamara, probably. Uh, Most likely. (laughs) Like, at this point. (laughs) Uh, All she hears is laughing and clinking glasses in the background and she later recalled the woman's strange laugh and that's all she could remember oh there's nothing worse than a strange laugh awful (sighs) nothing worse she hung up the phone um and before heading to bed she noticed that the lights were on and the curtains weren't drawn and that was strange to her because the kids always the younger kids that was their job before they went to bed and every night 
they would turn off the lights and close the curtains, and that was just standard procedure. So right. she saw that, and she thought, that's strange. Uh, she saw her oldest daughter, Marion, asleep on the couch and thought, okay, the younger kids probably just went up to bed in the attic and forgot to close the curtains. Right. At 1 a.m., half an hour later, uh, Jenny's woken up again by an object hitting the roof with a loud bang, followed by a rolling noise. And she's waiting, she's listening, nothing else happens. She's like, whatever. She falls back asleep. Another half hour later, uh, so now it's 1.30 a.m., she wakes up smelling smoke. Oh, no. Yeah. So she gets up, uh, looks around. She sees that her husband, George's office, is on fire. Oh! Um, wakes him up. Their older two sons wake up. Uh, the parents and four of the ten children escape the house. And so it's Marion, the oldest, two-year-old Silva, Sylvia, the baby, and then the two older boys. So they're all outside. They're frantically yelling. So, wait, there's four kids of the ten. Yeah, so the four So six of them are in the fire, presumably. Exactly. Okay. So they're all outside uh, screaming for the the kids. What good parents, by the way, just stand outside the house and be like, come on. No, so this is what happened. They they ran up to get to the attic and the whole stairwell was engulfed in flames. So they're outside trying to get the kids to the window, hoping they can jump out. So they're screaming and screaming. Uh, they try to call the fire department, but the phone line's out, of course. Um, a That's driver, what happens when it's on fire. Yeah, well, you'll see. A driver saw the flames uh, while driving by, called from a nearby tavern, couldn't reach the operator. Finally, someone managed to get through to the fire department. But at the time, the way the fire department worked back then was that each firefighter had to call the... Uh, it was like a phone lot, like a phone tree. Jesus. I know. So they had to call <sighs> the other firefighters to wake them up, to tell them that there was a fire. Hmm. And only certain people could drive the fire truck. So they were... It was just a mess. It took them hours well, to I get Well, I wonder there. why that system is out of place now. Exactly. So it took them hours to get there. Meanwhile... George, the father, decided to climb the wall, smash an attic window open, hoping to get the kids out. That's a real dad. Yeah, he cut his arm open. He planned on using their ladder, which they always kept at the side of the house, for the boys to climb up and grab the kids. They went to grab the ladder. It's gone. They're like, it has to be here Magical. somewhere. Yes. We search all around the property. Nowhere. The ladder is just completely gone. There was a water barrel, and they thought, let's get the water. We can try dousing the fire. It's frozen over. Um... They said, let's get the trucks. Maybe we can pull the trucks up to the house and try and everybody get up. The trucks, the engines are dead on both trucks. Oh. Um, so just, this is just a mess. So basically they have no choice. They're stuck. They're stuck outside. The firefighters are not coming. They watched the house burn down, collapse over 45 minutes. They just mm. thought, you know, my, our kids are dead. <sighs> so several hours later, the firefighters show up. Great. Yeah, uh, you really did your job there. <laughs> they also had low manpower, I will say, because of the war. Yeah, let's blame the war. Yeah, so they didn't have many people, and they had to call each other. So around 10 a.m., the firefighters went in, told the family they hadn't found any bones, and they said, oh, that's normal if they had been burned up in the fire. So the parents are just devastated. Um, the next day, or recently after, the fire marshal's office conducted an official investigation, and the inquest determined that the fire was caused by faulty wiring. So they said it was an electrical fire. Okay. Soon after this, though, uh, they're trying to rebuild their lives, and the Sauter family starts to question certain aspects of the fire. They thought, if this, has, if this was an electrical problem, um, why were our Christmas lights still working when the fire mm. was going? They saw the Christmas lights on, and the electric the electricity would not be still working if it was an electrical fire um they also said they found the ladder that they had been looking for 75 feet away from the house at the bottom of an embankment and there's oh like someone tossed it out yeah it was just in a ditch 75 feet away from the house that nobody would have put it there they always kept it in the same spot uh, a telephone repairman came by and said that the phone line had not been burned through in the fire, but had actually been cut. Oh! Uh, so by someone who had been a- who had been able to climb 14 feet up. So regarding the children's bodies, Jenny, the mom, started to question the firefighters, who said, "Oh, we didn't find any bones, but that's normal." Um, she said some of the appliances were still intact. There were even books that were still like a dictionary that was still intact. Uh, and other materials that would have burned if a right. body, entire bones. If a whole body can burn, then, like, paper would burn, exactly. right? Exactly. So she even took, like, took it upon herself to find animal bones and burn them. 
um, Good, herself yeah. to see Scientific like, if there's any way. And she said she tried and tried and tried. Nothing. She couldn't get them to disintegrate. Um, and she actually talked to a local crematorium, and the employee said that human body, human bodies will remain until burned at 2,000 degrees for two hours, which is way hotter than any sort of house fire. Like, you have to purposefully... Like, there's no way a house fire could have burned. I like to think my mother would be this, like, involved in my death. I know. They... Like... Said, literally. Okay, so when Stranger Things came out, I until like last week was begging my mom to see Stranger Things and she refused to watch it and I was like literally the show is about Winona Ryder being a better mom than you because her whole, she literally found ways to talk to her child through Christmas lights and all I need you to do is watch an hour of the show no. and you won't do it. You can't do it. Just like let's me. compare parents here. I like to think that my mother would be more Winona because you know Winona would have done this. Oh, Winona would have. She would be like, let's burn animal bones. She would have been in the backyard with the lighter. I yeah. hope my mother would, would put some sense into her to, to do something like that. I think she would. I think if like there was a mystery involved, yeah. my mother would be on top of it. I feel like our mothers would care enough to... Let's, let's just pretend. <laughs> I really hope so. We're going to believe it either way. If I burn, your job is to tell my mother to try. And, like, figure it out. I'll bring her the animal bones myself. Okay. And tell her that fact about the 2,000 degrees for two hours. She'll just listen to this episode and she'll know. Well, now, if she if she's a true fan, she'll listen and we don't even have to talk about it. That's true. That'll be the ultimate test. This is a message from beyond, Mom. This is the <laughs> ultimate test. Just try. Just prove, be there for me. Prove how much you love it. <laughs> okay. So, basically, it's sketchy. And so, regarding the trucks that didn't start... George, the dad, believed that they'd been tampered with. Uh, some people think the engines had flooded. So, in 46, evidence came out that the fire had been set deliberately. Uh, a bus driver said he had seen people throwing balls of fire, is what he called them, at the house. And when the snow melted that year, baby Sylvia found a small dark green rubber ball in the bushes around <gasps> the house. Ooh. And that was also interesting considering Jenny had woken up and heard banging on the roof. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. rolling. So that was kind of an interesting fact. Uh, some people even claim they saw the children themselves. A woman uh, who worked at a diner said she saw them uh, the next day and had served them breakfast. Um, another woman said she saw them in a passing car late that evening. And some other weird things. In uh, October of 1945, two months before this happened, a visiting life insurance salesman uh, was rebuffed by George. Like, George said, I don't want to buy your life insurance. And the guy said that your ho his house would, quote, go up in smoke and your children will be destroyed. Who said this? The life insurance guy? Uh-huh. He came by the house and George said, I don't want, like, go away. Whatever. It's a little ominous. Yes. Uh, he attributed this to all the dirty... Mar oh, that's right. He... George had been uh, bad-mouthing um, Mussolini, who had been executed... Uh, the year prior, and uh -huh. so a lot of people, it's a big Italian town, and a lot of people were extremely upset by the way he was talking out about Mussolini. Uh, so that is another It's like a thought. Mussolini fan. Exactly. Some people thought that maybe, like, the Sicilian mob was involved, gotcha. and people were oh, trying to oh, oh, oh. The mob is much more up. realistic than a fan of Mussolini. <laughs> a Mussolini fan. <laughs> Don't you dare say that about How Mussolini. How dare you? So he claim that his children would be destroyed, his house would be burned down. Another mysterious visitor who came by at that time, uh, who claimed he was seeking work, went to the back of the house and warned George that a pair of fuse boxes would, quote, cause a fire someday. George remembered this as being odd because he had just had the house rewired because they were putting in an electric stove. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that the electric company had told him everything was perfectly wired and perfectly safe. So the stranger showed up and said, oh, these fuse boxes are going to catch on fire. And he didn't know who he was. Just showed up. Um, Is there a theory that literally all these people were working together? That's nobody really knows. The thought is just kind of that, that nobody can figure it out. I would put the muscle so far. I'd put the. Mussolini mob I would have I would imagine that each of them were pretending to be a different type of person so one could go in and cut the phone line or one could go in and mess with the power lines right. and one person could be life insurance and warn them and one person could flood the car and yes, yes. I would so imagine each person was somehow involved in the same organization it's definitely one of those things where it's if if this is true what they say a lot of people were for sure involved okay um 
So the weeks preceding the fire, the older sons had also noticed a strange car parked along the main highway uh, and noticed that the people inside were watching the solder kids regularly as they walked home from school, which nowadays, if you tell your dad, oh, these people are watching me walk home from school every day. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You call someone. Your dad's going to go ape shit. Right. But back then, eh. <laughs> you know. They're probably not going to set our house on fire. We'll see. <laughs> Oy. So they hired this PI, um, and the PI actually uh, figured out that the life insurance salesman who had shown up at their house was actually on the jury that uh, said that the fire had been an electrical fire. So they had, like, an inquiry into the whole thing. They had a bunch of jurors who had to vote on what, you know, they believed based on the evidence. Right. The PI found out that the guy who had shown up and threatened him was actually on the jury, so that's a little fishy. Mm-hmm. So, the PI also found out that the local fire chief had told the minister that he had found a heart among the rubble. Like, a literal... Ugh. Yeah, a literal heart. And he said, I buried it in a metal box. So, well, he was confronted... Without giving it to the parents, being like, you deserve your child's heart. Yeah, their claim was that they didn't want to upset the parents. So, he... Bullshit. I know. So, he led the PI, or whoever, to the place where he supposedly buried this heart. They dug it up. Brought it to the funeral director. He examined it and said, in reality, it was very fresh beef liver that had never been exposed to fire and was recently buried. Oh, so like he needed to like cover, like almost like he told the story and then the guy was like, prove it. And then like that night he buried something to be able to dig up. Well, one of the theories is that the whole thing was planned and that he had hoped the Sodders would find the heart. So he told the minister and tried to make Uh. it... Uh, and so that the Sodders would be satisfied that their children did indeed die in the fire. Like, so they would, like, never, like, really think about it They wouldn't it again. question it anymore, exactly, and look into it any further. That's one of the big theories. Um, so the parents spent basically the rest of the, actually, literally, the rest of their lives searching for their missing children, who are missing to this day. Um, yeah, they're fully convinced, they were fully convinced, they've passed away since. Uh, they were fully convinced that they're still alive, um... After seeing a young girl in a magazine, it was a picture of a young ballet dancer. George, the father, was convinced that it was his missing daughter. Uh, He drove all the way to New York, drove to the school, demanded to see the girl. They wouldn't let him dead end. Uh, In 1949, they did another investigation where they discovered some small bone fragments in the house or among the rubble. Right. Uh, They were sent to the Smithsonian, actually, and they were investigated, and they were determined to be human vertebrae, all from the same person, someone who had died aged 16 to 22. Uh, The oldest of the Sauter children who had disappeared was 14. Oh, yeah. So it's unlikely it came from him. Further, they said it's possible, but the examiner also said that the bones had not been um, exposed to flame. So... Oh. They were like, where the hell did so, this So, like, this from? sounds like an organization, like, went into and put a fake body. It sounds in. planted. Yeah, a planted body. Yeah. So, since then, the Sodders put up this billboard. It's a famous billboard. They put it up at the side of the house and two more in other locations with pictures of the children and offers uh, of a reward. And those were up for decades. And they just waited and waited. They put up flyers. They uh, George spent his entire life traveling all over the country, following every lead he got, which was a lot. Uh, That's a dedicated parent. I know, I know. I mean, he was just devastated, and it's so tragic that he never figured it out. Um, George spent, yeah, his whole life looking for them. And one woman in Houston actually said that Louis Sauter, one of the kids, uh, had revealed his identity to her one night after too much to drink. Mm. She said that he and his brother Maurice were living in Texas. So when police finally tracked them down... The two denied being the missing sons. They said, no, that's not us. Um, Although supposedly George Sauter, until the end of his life, uh, believed they were his sons and that they were... That's what that tells you. Like, I mean, from the kind of parenting that it took for them to keep looking for their kids, you'd imagine that they're good parents. So why would these kids not want to be around them? Well, one of the theories is that the only thing that they could kind of explain to themselves as like a way of dealing with it was that the Sicilian mob was involved and the kids didn't like knew how much maybe trouble or threat they would be if they so like to protect their parents they stayed quiet exactly that was the only theory that they could come up with so nobody knows I mean and one of the theories is that the Sicilian mob took them to Italy and 
they've just never reached out and made contact and have but how bad was this thing that he said about Mussolini I don't know like I mean I mean like for all the bad things that we're saying right now about our government like would someone really go through all that trouble for one family it's hard to tell I mean I know that the the city they were in was like all Italian immigrants and you know Mussolini was a dictator so maybe he sent someone in Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I just, I wish I knew it. Like, I wonder what that, like, that comment had to be really brutal for that to be the family they targeted. Well, I think it was more also that he kind of made himself a target in the community. I read that he had a lot of arguments and bad relationships with people in town. Oh. I mean, the, the family was generally well liked, but. Like, he, they were the weakest link, basically. He had made enemies with people because he was very outspoken, very brusque, and I think he had stepped on some toes and so gotcha it's not totally clear but a lot of people think he he angered the wrong people basically mm-hmm. um and they were in a, like an, a heavily italian mm-hmm. part of the country so it's and terrifying it, yeah and it was a hard time for italy so who knows you know who took it the wrong way um probably the biggest lead that they got came from central city kentucky there was no return address it was a postcard um mailed in an envelope with a picture of a young man around 30 who had features that actually resembled uh, Lewis, the one of their sons, who would have been in his 30s at that time. Um, and on the back was written, Lewis Sauter, I love brother Frankie, Lil Boys, A90132 or 35. And no one... What? Had, it's just a mystery. What? It's creepy. It's creepy. Was it like a picture of him like in distress or just smiling? Just a picture. They you can see it actually. Um, we'll post it yeah. if you look up Lewis Sauter. But it's it's just a picture of a guy in his thirties. I would imagine in your thirties, like either you're brainwashed enough to be staying with those people, or you're crazy now too. Yeah, I mean it sounds One of the two. it's a wacky letter. Uh, so it says that. I mean they be- and you know you don't know if he actually sent it, but that was. They believe, I mean, and they're holding on to every hope they can, but they believed... That's almost less comforting. It is. To, like, get a postcard with your possible child's face and then some weird, like, ominous language. Yeah. Well, they sent a private, another private investigator to Central City, Kentucky to check it out, but he vanished, was never heard from again. They couldn't, Ugh. They couldn't find him. Oh, my God. Like, like, they found him and hurt him, or... Couldn't find him. Couldn't track him down. Um, so it's just creepy. And George, the father, he spent his entire life searching. He died in 1969. Um, Jenny and her surviving children, uh, continued to seek answers their whole lives. Uh, they all passed away except Sylvia is the only one. She was the baby. Yeah. She's the only one who survived the fire that's still alive. The only one, uh, John is one of the sons and he was the only one who said, we got to move on. We got to, you know, we've spent decades looking. Right. We got to just accept it. Right. Get on with our lives. But all the other children, he didn't talk about it, but all the other children and the parents spent their whole lives searching with the billboards and the, I mean, they followed. I mean, there's so many loose ends. So many. It's just a weird story. Like there's so yeah. many missing, like moving parts. Yeah. So. And I mean, if you were that young, if the oldest one was like 14, it's not like you had a grand plan to get away and actually pulled it off. Yeah. Like, someone had to help you, especially someone, all the people, like, to move a ladder or to cut a phone line. Like, those are things that a 14-year-old doesn't think about. Yeah. Like, someone had to help. And then for the f- fire department to be like, oh, don't pay attention. Like, I, I feel like there had to be, maybe they made friends at school and those kids were actually also planted to kind of be like, hey, put these ideas in their head to get out or, hey, you know, make friends with them and then teach them how to do all this. And I don't know, like, I mean, that there's... And the crazy thing is the smallest kids were really small, so it wouldn't... There had to have been adults involved, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just... Especially with all the crazy things that happened with the cars that didn't start and... And, like, the the vertebrae of a person who wasn't even yeah. actually there and, and the didn't touch fire. Hurt, and it's just all so weird. And the phone call to... Yeah. To Tamitha. What was her name? Tamara. Tamara. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> it's spooky. Yeah. So anyway, they're missing. They're gone. They're still listed as missing persons and no one knows where they are. So That's a thinker. It is creepy. And actually, um, 
the way I learned for, uh, about this was from a lovely podcast called uh, Stuff You Missed in History Class. Oh, I follow them too. It's a great one. And that, they did a really good episode on this. So I'm probably not doing it all justice, but it's just a creepy story. Creepy, creepy. That's something like if if my history teacher ever taught me a story like that, I'd remember for the rest of my life. Oh, I would have gotten a five on that AP exam. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I didn't. <laughs> well, I mean, God, that this was a juicy episode. It was. That was wow. just a really mysterious episode. Yeah, both of them have unsolved answers. If you guys know the answer to any of these mysteries, please write in and uh, <laughs> let us know what happened. If you're one of the Sodder children, write in. Oh, that'd be fun. And, and don't reach us in any other way. <laughs> <laughs> Just send us a Facebook message. Just send us a Facebook message and then leave us alone. Anyway. Spooky. So if you guys have a story, we are compiling a list. We got a bunch of great ones. But if you have any more, please send them in. We will cover them. Uh, the more the better and the juicier the better exactly and honestly the more disturbing the better exactly we want the creepy creepy stuff so whatever you got bring it on and we look forward to hearing from you have a good time drinking until next time we talk please do and don't forget to subscribe please give us a rating yeah we're still desperate we need a lot of attention just like my dog (laughs) all right well Thank you. Thanks, and guys. talk to you another time. All right. See you later. And that's, and that's why, why we, we drink. drink. Bye-bye. Bye.